All right. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, Maximus, I guess it's afternoon your time. Yes, yes. Here in uh, Sierra Leone, it is uh, just a little bit after 2 p.m. Okay. Um, so welcome. Welcome to the channel. Um, yeah, thanks uh, a bunch. Just a, a quick um, origin story of this stream. <clears throat> um, you had sent me a message, I guess, right around when I did the the moon landing stream. And yep. and I, I basically, you said, you said, if I buy you a copy of Sherrard's Rape of Man and Nature, will you read it? And I was like, absolutely, because I've been meaning to read that anyways. Um, and so <clears throat> you did. Uh -huh. You sent me a copy of the book. And I read it. And then what was it like the week after that? I was at church. And, you know, we had church like normal. And uh, and I remember in the in your message you had said, "Oh well, if we're going to do a stream about it, it's going to have to wait because I'm moving to Africa." I was like, "Okay, cool." Yeah. So I'm in church a couple weeks later, and you know we have church, and then at the end, you know we're like singing, you know, many years and you know, talking and this kind of stuff, and uh, and one of our parishioners, uh, John Hears, was like, "Oh, I've got this guy here, and he's moving to Africa." And I was like, oh, that's cool. But not putting two and two together until afterwards we talked. And then I realized, oh, you're the, you're you're that Maximus. Yep. So I thought that was a, a strange uh, coincidence. Yeah, I was a little worried that you would think that I had like stalked you there or something. <laughs> that would be very strange indeed. Uh, but so you're actually so OK. Before we do this, tell them about John's foundation. Tell them about First Things Foundation because you're working with John Hears through this thing, and I I only know the little bit of I, I know from John's podcast, which is um, why are we talking about rabbits? Um, so check yeah. that out. Um, but yeah, tell us about First Things. Yeah, so people sometimes call it, um, or I guess they compare it to like Peace Corps, but sort of like with an with an Eastern Orthodox inspiration. Okay. Um, we do a uh, small projects and, and aid work, but uh, um, we, we really emphasize uh, like trying to integrate into the communities where we're doing aid work. Because there's, there's a lot of mistakes you can do when you're trying to make aid work. Okay. When you're trying to do it, when you're trying to do aid work, um, yeah. oftentimes people end up like giving money and resources and time to you know sort of impoverished places in the world and. You know, it gets it gets eaten up by you know some powerful figure or other that's there, and you know it doesn't mm -hmm. end up actually helping the people that you're trying to help. Okay. And so, what what first things is kind of trying to do is send people to like very impoverished communities and have them live there for, I mean, usually it's two years. Um, to try to to try to figure out, uh, you know, what 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 the community really is that they're that's that's there, you know. Who mm. can you trust? How can you tell who to trust? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, how can we actually use resources to, to, to help this place? And something that's kind of unique about First Things is, generally speaking, we don't introduce projects. We find projects that sort of local entrepreneurial types already want to do and already are trying to do, but, you know, oftentimes don't have the resources or the connections to power structures to make that happen. Right. So, Mm. We try to facilitate that often. So what? So what? What are you working on right now? Like, what project are you guys doing? So I'm here just the beginning. So I'm yeah. I'm learning language and just trying to okay. to learn about what's going on here. There's <laughs> a we travel in groups of two. Um, okay. So there's always someone who's been here for you know usually at least a year or at least eight months. Someone who's yeah. experienced who is actually sort of working on the the you could say the business end of what first things is doing here and then we have someone in what they call the immersion ship phase which right now is me i've only been here for about a month and so my job is just to like learn about the people just make friends learn language uh <laughs> get used to the conditions right um all that crazy stuff so what but uh i, mean, I can tell you i mean we're we're working with a group of people to to help a, a, a beef a bee farm get off the ground oh, okay. and help them get connected with people who can find them buyers. Yeah. Um, 
we've we've helped make wells we've there's a number of things okay um all right cool um so let's get into this book a little bit um so we're reading uh rape of man in nature by philip sherrard and sherrard um Sherard was a uh, British, I think, and converted to orthodoxy in Greece because he was a translator and he translated a number of uh, collections of Greek poetry. And I think he worked on the Philokalia um, and some other like, you know, kind of like uh, really important foundational orthodox texts. Yeah, um, he, was, he was close friends with the uh, with Metropolitan Ware. Who okay. Sort of oh yeah, spearheaded, yeah. Spearheaded the the Philokalia <clears throat> transition. Yeah, so they did that yeah. together. Um. So, and I don't really know. I mean, do you know any of his background before that? I mean, no, I really don't. any of his work as a translator, like in Britain, or like what his education was, or anything like that. I didn't really research him. <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't really know. I don't have an extensive backstory for him. I mostly okay. just know this book. Yeah, and he. I mean, as as Orthodox writers go, he's he definitely is. Uh, he's an ecologist. I mean, he's he's he, he's always stressing ecology. He seems to be. I mean, I would. I mean, tell me if you think this is fair. I would characterize him as more on the side of um, more. Um, <clears throat> less like hard line, hardcore traditionalist orthodox and more kind of like, um, I don't know, uh, the, the free spirited, uh, slightly, uh, I hate to use the word liberal, but slightly, slightly, maybe less hard lined, um, the, on, on the orthodox spectrum. I don't, I don't know. I think maybe that's, uh, there's some truth to that. You, you get him heard um, compared to, um, oh, what's his name from California? Uh, Sarah from Rose quite a bit. Which oh, is right. kind of strange. He's yeah, really on I, I the other end of that spectrum. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, is that because of just like the critique of the scientific worldview? I, I would guess uh, maybe the way that they saw history. <clears throat> I know yeah. that they both kind of had a there were times in both of their lives when they, I guess, got a lot of insight from perennialism. So that yeah. is something that they have in, in common. Yeah. See, I, I guess I think of Sarah from Rose as being all about the rejection of perennialism. And I think of Sherard as being a little more friendly to perennialism. I think it really matters when in Sarah from Rose's life, you, you, you know, you, yeah. you're coming from, like I have, I was really surprised to buy a Rene Jean on book once and, Find that in the front cover there was a there was a big old quote from Sarah from Rose praising it. <laughs> I haven't. Nice. Um, all right. Well, let's. Um, so I've got my copy here uh, that you provided me with. Thank you very much. And it's all marked up and noted up. Um, now, just fair warning. I have not. I mean, I read this several months ago and marked it up. And we've been trying to do this stream. We've tried this stream like three times, and each time we've had to cancel. So it's yeah. been a while. So I'm gonna just try to dig through all these notes and highlights and things and, and piece together what I was thinking when I read it. For um, sure. So, uh, uh, so, so just to, to outline this, uh, I mean, basically, <clears throat> you know, this is a critique of the scientific worldview. It's a critique of technology. Um, ba basically, you know, the, the idea that at some point uh, in the Enlightenment or, you know, back up to Descartes or like so, somewhere, where, wherever you want to draw the line where modernity starts or, or really going back to scholasticism, um, you know, we there was an alteration in the basic anthropological understanding in the Christian West, which divorced reason from... The, what he calls the supra rational, you know, the, the 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 part of us that's you know the spiritual part that's connected to the mind of God or whatever, and that there had always been an understanding that reason was subject to that, right? But at some point with Aquinas or what I can't remember exactly how he lays it out, 
that was divorced. Kind of from Aristotle to Aquinas to yeah. from Aristotle to Augustine to Aquinas, really. Is kind yeah. of the path he was out. Well, yeah, yeah and he, he explains how, how how Christianity, you know, like like in the early centuries, it's more Platonic, it's more influenced by Plato, and then there's this transition to an Aristotelian an Aristotelianization of Christianity, which right. to him sort of you know, cause problems. And it's funny. I mean, this is exactly what I said in my talk at the US event. And I, I mean, I, I sympathize with this perspective and I've definitely played with it. Um, I, 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 mean, I, I find this whole question very uh, difficult because <clears throat> I think when you go along with some of this logic and you take these positions, it's really hard to to stop yourself from from sliding into a kind of like if you follow it eventually you kind of have to become the, a kind of like hardcore luddite uh like you you end up just having to reject all technological artifice because it's all bad or evil um and and you get to and you get you find yourself advocating for like you know we should just be like medieval peasants we should just go back to subsistence farming or something which i don't i don't actually think is true so it's i feel like there's a middle ground on this question there's something that i'm always missing when i try to understand it um yeah yeah well it, i mean Sherard himself, though, I mean, he says he doesn't want to go back, and then he says that he does. He's he seems almost conflicted about it. You can find quotes in the book where he says that, you no, know, we can't just return. Right. You know, we can't we can't return to this state before you know, you know, before you know the the Aristotelian sort of worldview, you know, took apart the Platonic. Yeah. Somehow we have to move forward, but then he, he characterizes it <clears throat> going backwards sometime, or or have like a reversal of the of the scientific worldview. I don't. I don't know. I mean, for myself, I mean, I don't. I don't think we can. You know, we can't just become full-on luddites. I'd. Yeah. I'd like to take what we can from Girard without, uh, maybe taking it quite to to that, to that logical conclusion. But I. I don't know how to do it either. It's. A, it's a confusing question. Right. But it, it's the question that, like, uh, like that. Really, that's the question that we're confronted with at this moment in history. Is like, how do we move? forward I, and I, I do see there is some kind of way to take what we've gained from this the, the you know this 500 years of uh, this you know kind of crazy descent into hyper rationalistic materialistic scientific whatever um, but, but like we've had to do it like it's been a necessary step in the process of uh, you know, moving us forward and we've got to take these tools into some new paradigm or something. Um, but even right. that, like, well, of course, when I, when I start talking like that, I'm like, well, that I'm, now I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm getting into some kind of transhumanist framework. Um, or even also when I start talking like that, I'm like, okay, well now I'm talking about a, 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 a historical <clears throat> process that is progressive well, aren't, isn't that cringe? Like, aren't we against um, <clears throat> pro progressive types of uh, historical views? So I, everywhere I go with this, I run into objections and problems and contradictions. Um, so, yeah. So let's just, let's see if we can actually get into this text a little bit. Um, and I'll, so I mostly, you know, just, just for the sake of fun, you know, mostly what I wrote in my notes were objections, like anything I objected to, I was like, no, no. Um, so it doesn't mean that I, it doesn't mean that I like totally disagree with him, but <clears throat> so the first, the first note I have is at the end of the forward and, and I'll put this question to you and it's one that I, I struggle with a lot. Um. In the last paragraph of the foreword, he's saying, well, he's, let me just read this. He says, well, well, I guess I should preface this. He's just, he's just saying that to become a scientist, you know, you have to <clears throat> put yourself through the 
training process and the, the worldview alteration necessary to become a scientist, which already is going to rob you of the ability to look at this issue clearly. Um, <clears throat> and he says, uh, thus, it is practically inevitable that the task of elucidating the intellectual origins of modern science and the metaphysical ideas that it presupposes, as well as assessing the consequences in human and other terms of their implementation, has to be undertaken by a non-scientist, for the scientist is unlikely to possess the qualifications needed in order to undertake it. Now, that sounds reasonable, but I don't necessarily think that has to be the case. I mean, it's kind of like saying, um, it, that, that's kind of like saying, um, oh, well, you know, a mathematician can't uh, critique Euler's method or, you know, some abstract algebra system. O only a non-mathematician can do that because the mathematician is already tra too trained in the worldview. And I'm like, well, that's, that's definitely not true. Of course, you would have to be trained in mathematics yeah. to undertake uh, any kind of proper <clears throat> critique and i can think that's that's true in all kinds of fields you know it's 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 you know prof professional um playwrights are probably the most equipped to critique uh you know plays and scripts so i'm not i'm not i'm not 100 percent on board with his claim um and I, I'm wondering if he's just if he's trying if he's just selling himself, you know. He's like, well, somebody's got to do it, and it's going to be me because I'm not trained in all this silly science. Sure, yeah, no, that, that definitely could be the case to some extent. I mean, i I would I would maybe explain that from some different angles than than mm. what he does, because I mean, I I don't think you do see a lot of prominent scientists really, you know, critiquing, um, you know, the modern scientific project or or you know what, whatever like scientism or that is true or, that's or, definitely true yeah and, and i mean i think you can really just talk about that in terms of prestige um you know the i don't think that you you become more prestigious in the scientific world by uh, you know being critical of the things that have made that scientific world powerful mm. so like I, th I think you can probably find scientists that are kind of on the fringe mm -hmm. but the people that are um really well-known scientists Generally speaking, I, I mean, I don't see that. Um, yeah. So I think, and, and you do. So like, you know, in my education, like it was strange. I, I always tried to talk to science professors um, about the philosophy behind science because I always thought it was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've, I really enjoyed science in school. And that was like a, it was always kind of a wall I hit where there, it's just surprising how little interest there seems to be. I mean, that's just my experience. I don't know. Yeah. But no, I think, <clears throat> I think that's definitely true. Um, I mean, I had a friend in high school who was in college when I was in high school and he took, um, he took like, you know, philosophy of science or something and it, and it completely, like uh, altered his paradigm, you know, because it's the first mm -hmm. time that it ever occurred to him not to take for granted, you know, the, the worldview that we're all taught uh, around the, the scientific method and all this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I remember, him, I remember him explaining this to me as a seventeen-year-old, and, and me too, just being like, you know, just like opened my mind. Um, it blew my mind, man. Um, so, <clears throat> but I think. Um, I mean, that's an interesting way to put it. So it's it's not so much that he's not trained in science, but that he's not part of the power structure that incentivizes blind spots. Um, Which is not what he says. I think that, I mean, you're right that he is technically wrong. I think his explanation yeah. for, for why that's going, like, no, I think you probably can really understand science very <clears throat> well and still, and still critique it. I don't think it, yeah. you know, suck your, sucks your mind into a black hole that makes you unable to unable to think outside it. I mean, Although, I'm trying... I mean I'm sure, there is something I'm sure about like investing in, yeah. in like the scientific, I don't know, the pseudo religion that is the scientific project, which is different right. from maybe scientific method. But I think there, there is something probably about really, really buying into it and putting a lot of your time and energy into that that makes you probably not want to tear it down. Yeah. Well, can you think of any examples of people who are 
like you know trained educated scientists who are who do like a, a, an actual legitimate critique of the scientific worldview uh, I, I'm a, so maybe John Ravaki. I don't know if you follow okay. him at all. Yeah. Okay. Kind of um, I don't, I don't really know enough about him to really speak on him <laughs> uh, yeah. authoritatively, but it, that seems to be that he's um, both really committed to, to using science well and to sort of being part of the scientific project, but also critiques that overreaches. At least that's what he thinks he's doing. That may, yeah. So, isn't he, I, isn't I he, in, one. is he an atheist? Uh, he probably. He I feel like he is. a non-theist. Yeah, and then, yeah. He, he gets upset if people call him an atheist, but I probably yeah. he's some atheist. Right. Um, okay. All right. So here's another question. Let me read you the end of this paragraph. Uh, he says. Uh, this is not to say that I myself do possess these qualifications in a definitive sense. I am only too aware of my shortcomings in this respect. But it is to say that I recognize the terms in which alone such a task has to be undertaken if it is to serve any useful purpose. And I have tried to write this book in accordance with them. I hope that as a result, it may at least be of some assistance to whoever is concerned to understand. Okay, key sentence here. I hope that as a result, it may at least be of some assistance to whoever is concerned to understand how and why we find ourselves today in a world in which it is increasingly difficult to live as a human being. Now, mm. when, when I hear that right away, I, that's like a red flag because I, I believe <clears throat> or I hypothesize mm -hmm. that it is not true that it is, it is somehow more difficult to live as a human being now than it is at some point in the past. And I, I, I talked about this in my last few videos about like, you know, I think there's a danger in having this kind of, uh, you know, romanticization of a more based or beautiful past. And, oh, it's so hard to be a human being today. I, I, I don't know if that's true. Uh, I don't know that, that there's any <clears throat> more or less difficult corner of history to be a human being in I, I i i imagine that it's something like you know no matter where you are in history mm -hmm. there's a there's a set of you know challenges and there's a set of benefits there's like pros and cons but it but it more or less it all balances at the end of the day because of the spiritual struggle that constitutes human reality that God has put us in. And basically it's just, there's just different, I don't know, there's different parameters. So if you, you know, if you live in, um, <clears throat> you know, San Francisco in 2020, you're mm -hmm. going to have a different, you're going to have a different set of challenges and a different set of advantages than if you're, you know, a medieval French peasant or something right. but but some somehow god's math works out so that you know you you have this basically the same kind of spiritual struggle um and so i don't i find it i i find it a little distasteful or or something when people start using this language about oh it's so hard to be a a human being in these times everything's so dehumanized uh, and I just, I mean, I, I don't know if it's true. I, I feel like we, th we, th we think that's true because we're here and we see, we, we're, we're really aware of the challenges of technological society. But I think if you found yourself, you know, on a farm 500 years ago, you would actually mm -hmm. be, you'd actually be pretty shocked at the, the challenges that awaited you in that situation. And you'd be, you'd actually be like, oh, you know what? I'm actually fine with living in in uh, Tokyo in 2022. I don't know. What do you think about that? So I think, so first, it, in order to understand this question if, from his perspective, you really have to understand what he means about being a human. Because when sure. he talks about difficulty being a human, he's not talking about, you know, the difficulty of your life or, or, you know, like how much suffering there is. 
he really is talking about uh, in this concept of, of the anthropos that he gets in into the first chapter where what it what it means to be human is to you know you could say reach reach your highest potential as far as in, in, in a spiritual way is to um, live into you know the the united divine and human nature um, and so from that perspective like you know the difficulties of it, it's it's weird to try to, to do this math, and I, I think it, you, you're you're right it, that it's really difficult from not being in in these places to to try to you know compare and contrast. But the suffering on a farm is, I mean, it can save you. It can make it easier to be human to really <laughs> suffer, as opposed to you know just be surrounded by things that um you know make your life easier and more pleasurable all the time. But couldn't you say, I mean, can't you say the same thing? Couldn't you say like, well, well, actually the struggles we encounter in this hyper-technological society can save us. They can be the way in which we, uh, it, you know, it's like a psychological struggle that can actually lead us uh, into, you know, a, a more real kind of spirituality because of the particular kinds of challenges it presents us with. It can show us the the inadequacy of, um, you know, <clears throat> mediated attention seeking, attention seeking. It can show us the futility of, uh, you know, try, whatever, trying to solve your problems through, you know, digital uh, technology, whatever. Like, can't you say that? Can't you make that same claim about any kind of challenge that is presented to human beings in the world of space and time? You can. You can. I mean, I, I would definitely imagine that if, you know, you lived in a medieval Christian village, though, you would be surrounded by uh, things that were calling you to participate in the <clears throat> spiritual struggle to, 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 to reach that potential, to, you know, to become divinized. Whereas, um, you know, as, as opposed to living in a society where lots of people are just going to go along with the, the messaging that is exactly the opposite. But but I don't know. I mean, that's that's really not a, a question that's easy to answer. I'm thinking of that Bible verse where it talks about how you know, for whom uh, much is given, much is expected. Mm. So really, really, the the math of the the math really isn't something that I think we can figure out. I think that's probably true. Um, we I think we can point to ways that um, we experience it as being difficult, and we can like you know, probably look at the, the people that we know and love and be like, oh, wow, the, 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 the situation that we live in now is such that it's degrading these people. We might look at ourselves and say, the situation that it is now is such that it's um, degrading us. And it, certainly the ways that people are degraded now are different than they were degraded several hundred years ago. Right. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, but, but you, you could be right. Maybe everyone really just has a an equal an equal opportunity in some way, or like in the way that it ma in you know, in all the ways that matter, everyone's struggles are the same or something like that. We could maybe. Yeah. I mean, that, that's my, I don't know. That's my like spiritual intuition because I've always said that about people, you know, <clears throat> when people complain about, I don't know, income inequality and stuff, I've always thought, well, it must be the case that whether you're rich or poor, you just have like, in, you, you have like, you know, you, you have an inverted set of <clears throat> challenges and, and benefits, you know, like <clears throat> if you're rich, you're going to have these sorts of temptations. And if you're poor, you're going to have like the opposite kinds of temptations. And if you're rich, you're going to have this uh, benefit that's going to come along with it. But if you're poor, you're going to have the opposite benefit, something like that. I don't know. It's just, I mean, I, I know it's an unanswerable question. I just, I'm skeptical of thinking that like, oh, uh, if I was, you know, in France in the 11th century, my spiritual life would be so much easier. When I imagine that if you actually could go back there, you'd probably find that that's not the case. There would probably be a whole host of challenges that you did not even anticipate that would be bundled with that world that would make you realize like, oh, I was actually fine in 2020 America or Africa. Um, I should have just stayed there. Um, 
and done my spiritual struggle or whatever. But that's so just you definitely, you definitely find in like in, in the gospels you find Christ saying repeatedly that it's it's more difficult for the rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than, than Okay, the well there man. you go. Yeah. So I mean that would seem to be like like we appear to me to be the rich man in comparison to you know the farmer okay. we're talking. About. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um all right, so that's the the forward. So in this, the first chapter, um, it, it's basically he's just kind of laying out your your standard Orthodox Christology and anthropology. I mean, is there anything you want to say about? I I don't know if we really want to like go into detail on that. You know, I, f I feel like if you don't know, then you won't know. That's that's like a whole topic in and of itself. Um, yeah. I mean, it's beautiful, and if you're yeah, you know, it's really well done. Read, read the book. Um, uh, yeah. You know, re we, I mean, would you say that chapter one is good, regardless of what you think of the rest of the arguments? Yeah, I mean, chapter one is. Oh, well, here's what I'll say about my my criticism of chapter one, and this is a uh, kind of like a large uh, I idea in this book, <clears throat> and and where I think that a lot of people who undertake these kind of critiques go wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, because Sherard, I mean, he's he's giving a very similar to critique that um, uh, that um, I don't know that uh, Heidegger might give, or Kierkegaard might give, or or any of these people might give, and <clears throat> and I think there's a danger here, and I and I say this all the time, where the problem is identified as, like we said, this kind of um, isolated worship of reason, the kind of deification of reason, the separation mm -hmm. of reason from the, the supra rational, uh, faculty that's supposed to be above reason to in, in order it and make it in accord with God's will and all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. the problem is identified as reason in some sense. So there, there's a temptation to identify the solution as a rejection of reason or a critique of reason or trash talking reason. And I don't think that, and I think that's a mistake because it's not, <clears throat> we don't want to, we don't want to do away with reason. We right. want to, we just want to reintegrate it back into spirit, but there's a lot of language he uses and a lot of, statements he makes where he's kind of like trashing reason. And I think there's just kind of, I used to do this too. And I know like, you know, this is, it's easy to do once you get into this kind of um, framework where, you know, mm -hmm. you, you kind of want to disparage reason, you know, like, Oh, you know, because you're, you're trying to, you're, cause you're trying to get, get it at arm's length. So you can like, you know, reestablish some kind of connection with spirit or something. But I, I just think there's a danger there. And then, giving into irrationality. So intriguingly, I kind of see that as a, as a pattern that goes on in just in orthodoxy in general. And I, I'm, it, it is interesting to think about what goes on, What I mean is that, you know, we have this concept of like, you know, some, there are things that can act both as icons and idols. Like that if they're mm. in the wrong place, if they're like brought up to this place that it's too high, yeah, then they become an idol and mm -hmm. you know, they, Whereas, you know, you can have something that is like in its right place in the cosmos such that you can venerate this thing and, and the honor like passes through it to up to God. Right. Yeah. And and so what what's interesting is. That there does seem to be this tension where you, you know, obviously you, you look around at the, you know, the tradition, you read hagiographies, you, you know, you read church history. There is a whole lot of smashing of idols that goes on. Yeah. Um, and and uh, you know, I think that it's it seems like there the, there really is this tension between like so do we just attack this thing that is for focusing that is like acting as as an idol to us, or do we work really hard to try to figure out how to put it in the right place in our lives? Yeah. And and I think that like even. I think even like different spiritual fathers will give you different advice in your own life for that. As far as, you know, if you're, you're struggling with this particular passion, what, what do you do? Do you 
Do you just not deal with it at all? Or do you, you know, like you could think, you know, you're having, you're having trouble with alcohol, right? Do you, do you struggle to figure out where to appropriately fit alcohol in your life? Or do you go, you know, you know, do you, do you become a teetotaler for yourself and, right. and to completely eliminate it? I, I, I think that tension is just always there. And so maybe yeah. Sherard has gone to one side, but I see people going to one side or the other all the time. Even like yeah. Saints writing seem to do that pretty often. Yeah. Like, like sometimes it's necessary in order to destroy the idol or to like take right. it down a peg or two. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a really good way to put that. And it could apply to so many things. So many of the ideas that we toy with uh, in this sphere, like, <clears throat> I mean, you name it, like, like, uh, you know, racial uh, <clears throat> uh, equality or whatever. It's like, well, that's an idol. That's become an idol that has been abused. You know, so there's this moment now where people are kind of like uh, maybe in a slightly occasionally unhealthy way, trashing all kind of like <clears throat> racial harmony just as a way to destroy this idol. Right. Which, right. Just, be exactly. just because the moment we live in. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay. I don't know. In my, in my, in my perfect world, I can, you know, I can live in this tension where, you know, the, both the people that are trying to do the smashing and the trying to people that are trying to do the reorienting are I mean, hopefully working together, even though they don't know it. Yeah. I mean, I, it's kind of gotta be that way. Cause if you, it's, it's, it's so deep in like the tradition, like both approaches. Yeah. Yeah. I just, in, in, in Sherrard's, in this chapter, in the, in the in the anthropology that he's building, I do get a lot of like he, like he says stuff like you know, um, <clears throat> he's talking about how divine ideas and divine energies are completely inaccessible to the perception of reason, you know, and it's he, he keeps he keeps like removing reason from deification, and he's like. Um, uh, you know, the, the soul and body are subject to penetration of the divine and they can participate in the divine and they're aspects of the image of God and man. And I'm like, but isn't reason also? I mean, reason is part of the, the structure of our being. It's part of us being made in the image of God. You can't just like chop that right. out and not include that. Right. And isn't reason, I mean, yeah, it, at its best, reason is suffused with the divine like reason is like in some sense reason is like the bridge um between the divine and the temporal or somehow it seems like when it's used properly it's a really beautiful thing it is suffused with the divine light and um and grace and energy and it's and it, and it directs <clears throat> human activity towards good and noble ends yes yeah, no, I, I agree. In its right place. In its right place, it, it it can it can it can do all of these things. I don't I don't take issue with that. Yeah. I wonder I wonder if we had Sherard in the room with us if we could, you know, if we could talk about that the tension. Again, going back like talking about it say so like as a can you take this thing that's been um, idolized and turn it into and 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 turn it into an icon and i think always the key to, to turning something from an idol and into an icon is taking it from its incorrect context into its proper context yeah so maybe maybe when you put it in its correct context it seeks to be pure reason i guess yeah. like mm. you could say like the, the correct place for for reason to be is um uh you know subservient to the noose which i mean sure. that, that's, that's that's what he's talking about is that, yeah that yeah. Yeah. Now he does, <clears throat> you know, and then he explains that, you know, the, the problem is the, the assertion of the independence of reason. It's this, you know, cutting reason off from the super rational and making it this thing that functions of its own and how that is generating all these problems and a, and a, and a false perception of the world, a false perception and experience of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um so that i'm i'm totally in agreement with um let's see yeah sorry sorry if i'm disappointing by not taking all of the hard lines he does I, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. well no that's that's good that's 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 good i mean this is fruitful because it's helping me think through this um 
So he, okay, so let's, the, the, the mechanistic character of modern science is marked by desire to dominate, to master and possess and exploit nature, not to transform it or to hallow it. It presupposes that the earth belongs to man and not man to the earth. Uh, now I do, th this does strike me as being a little bit like uh, woo woo. This is like a little bit, <clears throat> it has a kind of new age feel to it, you know, about how, uh, you know, man, uh, man, it presumes that the earth belongs to man, not man to the earth. Um, because, you know, I don't think man belongs to the earth. Like we're, so if we're, if we are, you know, God's, um, you know, if we're the stewards of this world mm -hmm. and we are like in the, in the platonic conception that we are sort of, we stand between God and the material world and we kind of mediate these things and we're the, we're the meeting place of the temporal and the infinite. And we kind of function as the, uh, not handmade, but what's the, what's the masculine version of that word? Uh, you know, we're, we're the, we're the agent. Uh, of God in this material world, we kind of represent God and we're here to have authority over things, to order them and to, uh, to mediate things. It seems to me then that it's a little bit of a false dichotomy, this thing about um, mastering and possessing and exploiting nature rather than transforming it or hallowing it I think that's a little e that's a little too easy because in some sense you know transforming and working with the earth as God's agent does involve authority and it does involve the need to master natural processes that does does it not I mean isn't you know isn't farming you know mastering nature in some sense and taming it um, and and wouldn't the same thing be true of like you know uh, building a dam or building a bridge or, you know, cultivating a, a forest or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, I don't see a really easily identifiable line between, you know, working with nature in this kind of like magical, you know, spiritual way and, uh, you know, mastering and, controlling natural processes in the way that technological man has done. Right. So uh, for me, the, I think there's a very particular pattern to the way that technology works. And I think it's, it's really tied into this is that, uh, and this isn't, this isn't me. I'm people, your audience will be like, Oh, I've heard this other places. Yes. I didn't come up with this, but mm. um, I, you know, tech technology, I think is, is something that always is kind of it, it's a double-edged sword like it, it makes us able to do things sometimes those are good things sometimes those are bad things like it gives us power <clears throat> yeah but it also makes us it also makes us vulnerable um i mean think think of just like a coat you know if, if you're if you're a very primitive tribe and you don't have very good coats you'll live in like a particular area because you you can't go into places that are too cold um and that, and uh, you know, the person who invents like a coat has brought something very powerful to your people. Yeah. And then you also, you know, now you go to these places that are really cold. And so if you, if you know, your coat breaks or you don't have coats, you know, you, you, you'll, you, you know, you're, you're now more vulnerable to the elements. And additionally, yeah. you start to lose knowledge because, you know, the, the, the tactics that you might have had for enduring some amount of cold that you were using earlier. Is just more difficult and now you become lazy and you just you just use you just use the technology instead of what you did before um so i, I think that that comes um yeah so i think that that's what we that's what we do when we when we uh, uh subdue the earth so i think that, that i think we had to do that i don't think that there was a way around that like humanity was going to do that <sighs> Um, I just think that, it, but it, as that, as that, you know, pattern progresses and we, we make things that give us more and more power, but they also make us more and more vulnerable. 
And so missteps become more and more catastrophic potentially. Um, so, and, but how, do, how does that though relate to the question of, of whether we serve Earth? Uh, that's something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to parse out. I mean, I suppose we serve Earth in the way that like you serve your children. Like, do you belong to your children? Do your children belong to you? Uh, it, just, it depends what you mean by belong. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's a good example because it's like there's not a clear line there. Like the way in which you serve your children, there's t there's always two things happening at the same time. On the one hand, it's like you you love them and you cherish them and you give them that love and you nurture them and da 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 da. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you view your children as like <laughs> in a sense like they're almost like animals that have to be tamed. You know, they're like, you have to also ex exercise a kind of objective um, um, discipline and you have to hold them to standards, whether you like it or not, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, the, there's like these two aspects going on and you can't just, people fail at parenting because they only do one or the other. You know, they only love and nurture and spoil their kids or they only are like a merciless taskmaster who has no personal relationship with the kids you know these are both bad options because the reality is there's this like there's there is this harmony between those two things and it's through that harmony that the real health comes and i think that's true of technology too and in fact i mean it's that's probably true of most things in this life because then our, our nature is this composite nature of temporal and eternal um, or, you know, we're, we're the meeting place of the divine and the material or, or, or whatever. So yeah, it's not really an, an answerable question. It's just something to try to understand. Do you, uh, have you, have you heard of Dr. Petitus? I don't think um, so. He wrote a book called The Ethics of Beauty. He's a he's a professor. Oh yeah, of, uh, yeah, yeah. I've had that. I've had that recommended to me by many people. Yeah. So something something interesting he says in that book is he says that I mean, he, he gives he gives lots of examples. I wish I had brought this book with me to Africa. I'd pull it out. Mm. But he says that um, all sorts of civilizations had this concept where you, you know the people that were ruling, you know, the ruled had a you know they they had to balance basically ordering the society and giving the correct amount of, you could say like freedom or something like that to the society, yeah. the right, the kind of, uh, yeah, the, the, the kind of thing that if you take it too far becomes social justice, whatever that thing right. is in the appropriate right. place. Yeah. And, and what the point he makes is that you find this in old Christian societies, but also pagan societies is that, it was basically always viewed as a miracle if a society was able to balance those two things. Like yeah. they would try to get it right, but then it was kind of acknowledged that without the divine, that isn't going to happen. One is going to end up swallowing the other unless this is brought under, under some sort of divine agent that's going to fix that. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it seems like, it seems like there might be some wisdom there. And I think that's the same thing with, with your children. And I think that's why you hear, you know, Orthodox monks saying all the time that the best thing to do for your children is to, you know, pray, pray to the Theotokos that she'll be a good parent to them because you'll try it, but with, without some miracle, you'll go wrong one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing with marriage. You know, it's like it, yeah. marriage only works when you have both of those things, when you have, you know, you can love and cherish and respect <clears throat> your spouse, but also you can exert authority and you can, <clears throat> you can say no, you can, you can, you know, tell your wife what time it is, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I, I'm sure that, I'm sure that sounds like I'm just like throwing my hands up and saying, you know, Oh, I can't do anything about this to some of your audience, but I don't know. I, I don't have a good answer. And it seems like, a lot of traditions throughout history said that we don't have a good answer to how to, how to balance those two things. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, it's just life. That's, 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 that's the whole challenge. Um, 
So, okay, in the next chapter, uh, this is where he gets more into Aquinas and talking about the, the kind of Aristotelianization of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And and the problem with doing that is now without getting like super philosophy autistic about you know substances and stuff. Uh, basically, how would you say that um, the the consequence of Aristotle's metaphysics are basically that that God can't be present in man in the way. In, in in the way that orthodoxy understands or or the, or the way that the ancient church understood god if you if you follow aristotelian logic you have to reorient your your understanding of christianity because you end up in a situation where god can't where you don't there's no there's no theosis there's no actual um like god there's can't no actually right right yeah, essentially yeah there's no incarnation um and so, and so God can, God becomes something that can only be known externally, you know, as a, as an object of study, like any other. Right. Which is a and completely, which is a totally unorthodox yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 What is it? Not, not only is God not present in the human, he's also no longer present in the rest of the cosmos either. Right. Right. So that, that's 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 the case that Sherard is making is that that is that Aristotle eventually leads to that that the the, the dividing of those things. Humanity is not in nature. God's not in nature. God's yeah. not in humanity. God's not in nature because right. everything is made up of one substance, and so the divine substance can't participate in any other substance. Yeah, and I think that's right. good to 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 point out to people because you know it's I think I think a lot of non Christians will try to say you know that's christianity and people will 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 dismiss christianity because they don't like the idea of you know that god is separated from the world and and god is against man and god is against nature and all this kind of stuff and it's like well that's not actually christianity proper i mean that's a that's a development in the scholastic period and also also this is not it's not descartes that's responsible for this like this this happened you know, centuries before Descartes. Um, so, and, and then I guess the, the other thing is that this conception does away with any kind of need for asceticism or contemplative tradition in Christianity, which, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much that really plays into the, the, the topic here, but it's true. Um, what else? Uh, uh oh, we lost Maximus. Um, <clears throat> basically, Aristotle leads to atheism, or it, it leads you to a type of Christianity where you've done away with the incarnation, you've done away with theosis, you've done away with um, any kind of presence of God in the world. Um, it's going to lead you to materialism. Um, okay, so let me skip ahead here. What other notes do I have? Maximus, I don't know. He's got that janky Africa internet, so maybe he'll be back. Um, all right, the next chapter is uh, Modern Science and the Dehumanization of Man. Modern science presupposes a radical reshaping of our whole mental outlook. It involves a new approach <clears throat> to being, a new approach to nature, in short, a new philosophy. Born over the last few centuries on the wave of the excitement of formulating and applying this new philosophy, we have tended to take it for granted uh, that it represents a great breakthrough, a marvelous advance on the part of mankind, and even a sign of our coming of age. Now, I, I mean... <sighs> I'm like, no, I mean, is that not true? This is, you know, when, when I come across statements like this, I'm a part of me is like, this is the kind of thing that I'm, I'm traditionally been on board with is that it, you know, it's an illusion that, um, that, uh, that we're making, uh, an advance, uh, that we're coming of age. 
<clears throat> that we are, you know, that we're experiencing breakthroughs uh, as a species or whatever, but it's like, aren't, aren't we? I mean, are we not? And this, I mean, this comes down to a basic uh, paradigm question of like, you know, of, about progress. You know, so the, the, the entire kind of neo-reactionary dissident right thing is built around a rejection of, of progressivism, n not in terms of like, you know, um, gay stuff, but like, you know, progress as an actual, uh, you, know, you know, valid process that's happening through history. And in reality, there is no progress. There is no process. It's all an illusion. But I'm like, I mean, really? I don't know. I just, I have questions about that. I mean, doesn't it seem like we are, we have changed? I mean, we have, we have mastered this planet in a sense, or we have mastered so many material processes and natural processes um, through mathematics and through physics and through the use of reason <clears throat> out for good or worse, but, you know, co conquest is in our nature, is it not? I mean, this is the other thing I was thinking about about this is, isn't conquest, you know, part of who we are? Uh, not, not conquest for, you know, this reason or that reason, but like, you know, like Captain Kirk said, we climb the mountain because it's there. Um, there's something, there's some kind of spiritual element to that, isn't there? You know, this 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 desire to conquer horizons. And um, oh, oh, I think Maximus is back. Hold on. How about that. Oh, there you are. <clears throat> yeah. um, did you catch any of what I just said? <laughs> Uh, I, I right, let me, to a point. Let me, yeah, let me you back might up. want to reiterate it. <clears throat> let me back up. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a few tangents here, but I, I'm wondering because in in the next chapter he's talking about how um, you know we have this new philosophy, this new scientific worldview, and we take it for granted that it represents a breakthrough, a marvelous advance on the part of mankind, and even a sign of our coming of age. And that's the kind of sentiment that I'm, you know, I'm on board with, or I have been from time to time. I play with that position, but there's also a part of me that's like, but isn't it true? Like, are, are we not uh, making breakthroughs? Are we not changing? Are we not, have we not conquered certain horizons? I mean, it, and, and I was saying that it comes down to this really basic question of, of paradigm, which is like about progress. And, you know, is progress a real thing or is it all an illusion? And there is no real progress because I don't know. I mean, to me, it just seems like, no, we are, we are um, progressing in some sense. We are, we're, we're, we're moving. There's some kind of story that we're playing out as a species. You know, we're, I mean, right now we are becoming interplanetary you know it's it's like that is an actual new status of our of our species so i i don't know i just don't know how to how to think about all this properly because i know all the dangers and i know the you know you don't want to get into being a transhumanist or you know you can have you can have such an infinite vision of progress that you become a transhumanist but without advocating that it, in some sense, are we not developing and progressing? So in, in your view, what, uh, what does the progress serve at this point? Uh, like, a, like, what, like, like, look, what is, like, what is appealing to you about coming interplanetary? Is it just, okay, is it just surviving that, longer? Like, what is, a, how does that work? That's a great question. And I was thinking about that this, this morning. And the, the other thing I was just saying was about the spirit of, conquest in man and it's that in the proper role of that okay so like when when you know men set out on the ocean to conquer new horizons <clears throat> right or uh -huh. or when when men set out west on the american continent you know to to like forge 
civilization in the wilderness. Okay. What, what is the, like, like you're asking, what is the, like, there, there is, there's some kind of spiritual something operating in that, in that motivation. And there's also something fallen motivating that. So there, there's some, there's, yeah, there, there sure. so there, there's some kind of, there's some kind of spiritual push to, and, and, and I don't even know what it is, but like, you know, we, we go, we go and conquer horizons without even really knowing <clears throat> why or what the result is going to be generations down the line. But we know that we've got to go out into the woods and, and, and get it under, get it in hand and build towns and build cities. And, you know, we've got to go out on the ocean and find new territory because so that there can be someday, you know, uh, you know, towns and cities of children and families, uh, uh, in, you know, practicing, uh, sane human living and spiritual progress, which is very difficult to do, you know, if you're a subsistence farmer living out in the middle of the woods or something, I don't know, something like that. Sure. Sure. Um, it's 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 interesting. You you uh you mentioned before that Moby Dick is one of your favorite books, right? Yes. Because I think this is a lot of what this book is about, and it like it, it's just interesting because I it does it doesn't seem like it that book thinks that this quest has a good end. Yeah, yeah, um, right. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, well, I I, it, I mean it, it's similar to all these things we're talking about about how you know there's really there's there's always two aspects of everything, you know, there's like a, <clears throat> there's a, you know, a spiritual aspect and a fallen aspect, you know, just, just like with raising children or just like with yeah, yeah, for re sure. reason or whatever, there's always these two things going on. And so it's, it's hard to, it's hard to isolate some aspect of human endeavor and be like, well, this one, this is bad and evil. It's like, well, there's probably some kind of balance that's lacking in there, you know, like all, all these dichotomies and dialectics are probably, you know, to a large extent illusory because we're in a fallen condition when in reality, there's some kind of like, um, there's some kind of imminent harmony possible between these two modes in, in all these different sectors of human experience that if they were properly harmonized would just create, you know, uh, spiritual uh, progress or spiritual uh, uplift or, or wh whatever, whatever the goal is. So, something uh, like in, in ecology where, where spiritual, like, per, like spiritual progress can thrive, something like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, so maybe, so yeah. maybe you know, we've got to go to Mars so that in a thousand years, you know, there'll be like, um, you know, uh, monks on Mars or something. I don't know. So that, so that, and that, that's kind of the question to me is, can we, can we, you know, do these, you know, amazing technological like feats um, without destroying our capacity to see spiritual reality and without, you know, without feeling like we're turning ourselves into gods and being tempted to worship ourselves because of our apparent power. Um, well, it's definitely, it's, it's an almost, it's like an, it's like a limit question. It's like a, um, <clears throat> it's a, it's an existential question. It's like, we're, we are so close to crossing that line and have been for so long that, you know, we're, we're in like grave danger. And so there's this unanswered question uh, is, is like, are we going to be able to get it together and not not just fall into that and destroy ourselves, but are we actually going to be able to come through this period of modernity and scientific, uh, you know, with all these tools that we've acquired in the last few centuries and move, move back into a more like sane, healthy, spiritual human paradigm, but take all that with us. You know, like, are we gonna be able to like have Wi-Fi and headphones and whatever, but 
but reestablish some kind of sane human life where we're not, you know, <clears throat> just, you know, like techno fascist zombie people. Right. And what's interesting about this, I mean, I don't know if this is an answer, but I think it, it gives depth to what to what you're saying is that this is also what the, the story of the Tower of Babel is about. This is not like a particularly new thing to think that our technology has made us um, su such that we could, you know, challenge God. Right. Um, and, and, and what's the, the it's interesting is that the pattern that seems to be described about that story in the Christian world is that the attempt to build this this monument to I don't know to to you know human self deification is that it destroys the settlement and scatters it that that is attempting to do this project and it's not brought back together again symbolically until Christ when he you know on Pente like uh, the Holy Spirit I suppose on Pentecost when the the languages are you know reunited through the through the apostles so yeah. the um. So what does that mean as, as far as, is, is, is this the cycle? Is, is the cycle something like, you know, we're doomed to pursue this project until, <laughs> you know, until, until the whale kills us. Right. And then it's at some, at some future time, like the pieces will be brought back, back together by, by, you know, basically by divine providence, by some people who are, who are more in touch with, with the noose. I don't know. Um, well, I mean, this is it, and that that I mean that that's a similar thing to what academic agent pointed out in one of the things where he was he was critiquing my something that I did. He was said um because I was talking about this process, and he was like, "Well, but in reality, every time a, a civilization builds up to this high level, um, it it crumbles and falls, and it returns back to the beginning, and it's like we're just caught in this loop." But what I said to that was, yes, but every time that cycle goes through, we find ourselves a little further down the road. It's like, yeah, there is a there is this circular pattern happening, but it does seem to be making some kind of forward motion because like we're not we're not at the same place now that whenever the last cycle was and whatever the state they were in we are farther along because we have robots on mars like it's just it's an it's an objective fact that we're not caught in a in a cycle that is not going anywhere because we have made yeah. strides that are incomparable to whatever the last cycle was so there there's some kind of what you call it what you want but it's it's what is identified as progress there is some kind of forward motion to these cycles that's taking us in some kind of direction. And maybe, you know, we don't know what God's plan is. You know, we could have, you know, a thousand years ago, you might've said, uh, you know, like, well, God wouldn't want us to go to the new world. We should just stay where we are and pray. Well, but that's not God's plan. You know, the, the plan was for people to come to this continent, you know, and that's what happened. So maybe there, I mean, who knows, you know, Apparently, we are becoming an interplanetary species. You know, we don't know what God's plan is for that. You know, and I think it's I think it's almost hubristic to say, oh, well, we know that God doesn't really want us to go to other planets. We should just stay on the earth. It's like, well, how do you know? Maybe that's exactly what God's plan is. Why do you imagine that we are in a superior place instead of just a different place? Because, like, well, I, you know, I see what you're saying about like robots, rob, robots on Mars and stuff like that. And you know that you're right. That's these are things that, um, you know, civilizations in the past would you know wouldn't have even have dreamed of, perhaps. Mm. But you know, don't you imagine that we've also lost things that they had? Yeah, and I mean, yeah, of course. Do you think it's a net, do you think it's a net gain <clears throat> necessarily? Well, that's, I mean, the question is, it's not clear to me, you know, it's not clear to me that it's a net gain or loss. It's clear to me that, I don't know, it's hard to say, but it's like something is happening, you know, something is, you know, we've made some, we've made some kind of gains, you know, e even if those gains are just material, you know, I mean, what we've gained from this expedition into the modern scientific uh, 
paradigm over the last 500 years. What we've gained is a lot of uh, solutions to pesky problems of living in the world. You know, we've gained the ability to solve a lot of um, material needs which you could certainly argue frees up time and energy and space towards spiritual pursuits. I mean, you know, one of the things Sherard says is, you know, he's talking about how like, oh, well, you know, all of our pursuits now are just purely concerned with material well-being and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, that's true. But is that not a good thing? Like, you know, aren't, aren't you in Africa to like help people solve some of these problems and to have more, you know, clean drinking water and to like, you know, isn't it a good thing to have like some, you know, modern medicine coming into, you know, the jungle? Like, aren't, aren't these positive things? I mean, you can say they're not positive, but that, that seems a little anti-human when you consider like, oh no, of course it's better that like children uh, aren't going to just like drop dead of, you know, X disease and, and like people can actually have a chance to live, you know, because there's some value to life and there's some kind of value to being able to pursue, you know, a spiritual life or pursue a life period. I I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is, but but those are some of my thoughts. Specifically, as far as first things is concerned, it's, it's an interesting question because, um, <laughs> like John likes to say, if if uh if he, someone gets to the interview and he asks them why you know why why they want the job and they say well I want to make you know I want to make the world a better place I want to help the poor, generally speaking the interview's over. Yeah. Um, the uh, and a lot of what what first things is actually I mean you you are it is taking you to a place where there are people that are suffering greatly and it's 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 you know the the point is it, it allows you to love these people. Um, in in situations that is, is extremely difficult um, for you and for them and and you know so you, you do help them in a way but they also help you. Um, a part of what first things is actually interested in is by is um, is is showing the people that sign up like me, the field workers who come in and to some extent to embed ourselves in these societies that there is something there's something kind of ineffable and human that has survived in some of these societies that have not been so deeply touched by the enlightenment. Yeah. Um, that is, that's really hard to find in the West. It's, it's really, I mean, I, I can't, it's hard for me to talk about it because I've, I, you know, I, I kind of buy into it, but I've, I've not been here long enough to really, to really have the experience that some of the guys I've talked to have. Um, but, but a lot of the guys that come back, you know, if they if they do the whole two years, on the other side they they say that there's something. I mean, I mean, if you don't like to say that they're more they're more human here, they're they're there's something that's less robotic about them. There's something that's less um, interested in taking I don't know taking advantage of 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 the world in a particular kind of way. There's something that. I, I don't, I don't want to romanticize, you know, people that are living in these, you know, sort of developing situations. Like they have their own problems for sure. And right. But you're just, you're, you're, right. Problems. Right. You're just saying that. Yes. But, but they, they do, there's something there. They, they have something that maybe we've given up, you know? Yeah. And, yes. and, the, and, but, you know, and the question is, well, then why go, you know, like we don't just leave them alone because they're better off. But the answer is like, well, they have something that we've lost, but we've gained something that they haven't gained yet. And somehow there can be some kind of fruitful collaboration between these two things to answer this that's question, to answer this question thing. of like, well, you know, what can we take the tools and the things we've gained in the last few centuries from science but then bring them back into relationship with the some kind of spiritual core that we've we've had to put down for for a while, you know. Right. It sounds like a monstrously difficult task. I, I mean, really, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't, mean we shouldn't, doesn't mean we shouldn't try it. Um, I, I've, I, but I feel like it's that's the question. Uh, that's that's the question that we face. That's the nature of the future. Is like, can we do that? 
if we can do that, then <clears throat> we'll have a future. And if we can't do that, we're not, we're not going to have a future. Things are just going to get worse and then it's going to end in self-destruction. Right. It's, it's, in, it's interesting. This, uh, it leads you to almost talking about like reframing progress. Yeah. Where, where, so like, there's like a false, there's like a false progress. And, and that's like most of the time, what is, what is imagined to be progress. And then there's something, there's something like progress that is, I don't know, like going up this, going, you know, going up the spiral as, you know, as, as there are these cycles yeah. trying to find yourself in a, in a better place each time. But, yeah. but like you got to, you, we have to resist the temptation to think of it in terms of quantity, you know, just to res resist the temptation to think of it in terms just of, you know, you know, yeah. we, this is, this is a measurable, a measurably better society somehow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, sure. And that is, that's the, that is the, that's the ditch that we constantly fall into in this period is just using quantitative metrics for evaluating, you know, success or failure or, you know, like in the establishment or, or the governance or the management of any of these changes. Um, but it is, <clears throat> Yeah, it's like when when we when we you know the critique of progress is the critique of this kind of Faustian idea of you know infinite progress and this mm -hmm. this thing that leads us to this satanic transhumanistic kind of thing. So when when I say progress, people will hear that and they'll say, "Oh no, that's bad." It's like, yeah, I know that's bad, but that doesn't necessarily that's not the only possibility you know there's some other way to conceive of quote-unquote progress that is yeah like like going up the spiral or something or, or you know I, I just something is happening like some some forward movement is being made it seems to me over history and it's hard to say what that is because i can't go back a thousand years and point at the spiritual condition of all the people on the planet and then compare right. that with the spiritual lives of the people on the planet now. But something in me says, you know, the fact that you and I are having this conversation right now somehow indicates that like, well, there's some kind of forward movement happening because if we went to, you know, I mean, because I'm in North Carolina and you're in Africa and we're neither one of us are, you know, professional scholars, and yet just two normal people with pretty affordable technology can have these kinds of, you know, conversations, and this is happening all over the planet. Somehow, that seems like a good thing to me that is not necessarily something you're going to encounter if you go back to, you know, uh, 14th century Sweden or something. Maybe. I don't know. Um, okay. So, all right. Anything else on this chapter or any other points before we move ahead? Um, uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't, yeah, I guess not. We, we can, we can move ahead for now. I don't, I don't want to run out of time. Um, well, I mean, if you got, if you got a point, you know, go, go ahead because I don't, I'm trying, I'm just scanning through my notes here and not, nothing is jumping out at me yet. So if you want to just talk for a second while I look at this. Well, just the, the, what you're saying about the conversation that we're having now, it, it is very interesting that it, it's, again, it seems that it's, it's given us the power to do this thing, which is kind of amazing, but it also, which you all know, we're living in a world where, you know, relationships are being replaced by this. Sure. Where you know we, people, friends don't touch each other. Friends don't go to church together. Friends don't actually share the same space. Yeah. Um, and, and there, there is something for for all of all of the the benefits that it's given us. There's something that's counterfeit about relationships that are built this way. Even yeah. if the even 
and even if the conversations that they facilitate are in some ways mm. really kind of, yeah. mm -hmm. no that's a really good point and it actually i mean <clears throat> i think part of that is <clears throat> you know okay yeah so because we have this technology you and i are able to have this conversation and mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of people that we know and a lot of people in this sphere are able to have dialogues that ordinarily would not occur. Um, right. You can have yeah. conversations that you couldn't necessarily have in public forums, you know, da, 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 da. There are benefits to it. At the same time, this technology has, you know, eroded relationships and it's, you know, we don't, we don't have to enumerate all of the pathologies that are generated by this kind of technology. But what I what that says to me is that it's that that's on us. Like it's it's our own agency that's at fault. It's not the technology. We're just not using it right, and that's on us. You know, it, it's it it brings up this thing about free will. It's like, well, do we actually have the free will to to use these things one way or another, uh, or is it or is the technology itself responsible for the dehumanization? And I'm just, I'm skeptical because it seems to me that it's a question of human agency. You know, it's like, it's our fault. It's our fault that we're misusing these things. It's our, it's, you know, don't blame the technology. The technology can be good or bad. I mean, I know that's, that's kind of like a, a, a tired idea is that, you know, technology is just neutral. It's just a tool, you know, it can be used for good or evil. And I, and I know the arguments for saying like, no, actually the actual, the structure of technology itself or the worldview itself causes a dehumanization. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't have as clear a sense of that as I maybe would have taken a few years back because I don't know. I, th I think there's more of human agency at play than people want to take responsibility for. Right. Well, and the unfortunate thing is, we can't we can't live in a world where every time you know some major advance in technology happened we figured out how to live with it well in such a way that it didn't you know erode the you know the, the spiritual world around us yeah. before we moved on to you know inventing the next thing that was another huge leap forward and so it seems to me the situation we have now is that we have leap forward after leap forward after leap forward, and we haven't figured out how to how to healthily live with the leap forward that happened, you know, 250 steps back. So yeah. what do we do now? <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the question that confronts this whole critique is like, well, I mean, because Sherrard will even say things like, um, let me find, I just saw one. You know, he'll say... Um, because he's talking about how the conditions of our our work life and everything, you know, is dehumanizing itself. He says, um, you know, the conditions of work cannot be repersonalized or rehumanized without a dismantling of the whole present scientific industrial structure. And it's like, okay, dude, that's not going to happen. You know, no. the, the, so the, there, there, there is no solution to this of like, well, let's just go back to being uh, subsistence farmers, medieval style. Like that's not going to happen. It's not, that's not an option. And I don't even, th I don't even know like why you'd want to do that, but, but th th there's some other way forward. I imagine, and I can't explain how the, how it works, but I can, I, I, I envision a future in which somehow we take these, we, t we take the products of this weird, you know, period of, of history that we've been living in, but we move it forward into some kind of rehumanized world. Um, because you're, a, the only other okay. alternative is just to put an, a total end to all industrial civilization. And that's just not going to happen. I mean, here's a, here's a, 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 a I don't know. Um, it's just, it's not, something to imagine is imagine a group like the Amish who um, 
like, but but instead of trying to basically remain stable, their <laughs> goal was always, to, okay, we're going to try to integrate this next piece of technology into our community, mm-hmm. and we'll wait 20 years, and then we'll try to judge, has this improved our lives? Has this improved our spiritual lives? Has this, are we better off for this or not? Right. Um, and then, and, and it wasn't, so that so that's <laughs> maybe you could imagine that that's what a what a space travel would would eventually allow us to do is to set up communities on different planets that would be able to try things like that. I don't know. Okay. Um, but <laughs> yeah, we'll have an Amish planet, you know. Then we'll have a Mormon planet, and then we'll just let these things run and figure out which one's the best. Ooh. Okay. Well, I guess. <laughs> Yikes. Okay. So, so I, yeah, I don't know. So I don't know the the only thing that I think that we can really do when we, when we're really taking this to a practical level is try to figure out how, uh, maybe not, maybe not the only thing, but I think an important thing for us to do is to, to figure out how we as individuals and we as our communities can try to, I don't know, cult, cultivate, seeing God everywhere present and filling yeah. all things yeah. and trying to, and trying and like, I, I think doing that will have to involve for many people uh, some sort of disillusionment about technology being like always this wonderful thing that has never, you know, hindered us seeing the world properly or has never tempted us to act incorrectly in the world. Right. Um, so perhaps Sherard is like falls too hard on on certain issues, but I don't know. I, he seems like a good beginning to that conversation, at least. So it's like, how do we? Yeah, like the the problem we have now is that we have these tools, but we worship them. So, like, is it possible to keep the tools? But to but to like you know keep them at arm's length so we don't actually worship these tools we're just like you know we just have them you know like like a, like hammers you know it's like we wouldn't give up hammers right like surely nobody's going to make the argument that well hammers are a product of uh, technological thinking therefore they're evil therefore we got to get rid of hammers I mean like like surely we can keep hammers you know so the the question is like well just scale that up to now like can we keep uh, you know, lunar orbiting, you know, spacecraft without worshiping them. Or it's just like, well, this is just another tool. This is another hammer. Right. Right. Well, I think that, again, I, I think it's, I think it's the problem of, of technology in general. I, I think even hammers participate in like this dual nature, right? Just, just simply because they make us more powerful. Yeah. And power for when, when you're when you're powerful, you know you can you can do things with that, and it'll it'll end up making you vulnerable when you're more powerful, almost almost always. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think that that again, this is not a this is not a, a novel observation, but that seems to be a pretty common interpretation of you know what's going on with, um, you know the the garments of skin in Genesis. That's kind of like the archetypal technology. So from the from the this it's this thing that's added to our nature right 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 after the fall and then and that's and then you know so then you you read that chapter in Genesis you go from from uh from the garments of skin to um to musical instruments to um, metal forging to weapons of war to a city and you know just a couple paragraphs um, yeah there it seems like it's all it's all presented as part of as part of one sort of, uh, I, I guess, progression. Um, but uh, yeah. Hmm. Sorry, I don't know. How, I don't know. I don't know how to tie that thought up with a with a bow at the end. But the, um, yeah, I like. I, I think that it, you can't even go to hammers and say that it doesn't have a dual nature. I think everything's everything participates in that dual nature. And so learning how to, you know even learning how to properly use a hammer is good, you know, because I mean, you can build things with a hammer that will change your society. You can build things with a hammer that will, you know, 
I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, it goes back to the question of like, well, but you know, if we're if we're the stewards of this planet, if we're like God's agents, well, like surely that there's a proper role for hammers, like because. Well, if we're if we're like God's agents in this world, and we're here to like take care of this place and to and to steward it, surely we need certain means of fashioning, directing, and controlling natural processes, and that's what technology is. To me, you know, a way to think about technology in a in a healthy way is just that that this is part of what we need in order to be the the, the you know God's stewards or God's agents in the material world. As well, we need we need this we right. need these tools. Um, now, right. if we could right. if we could actually conceive of them like that, because the Amish have hammers and they worship God, you know, it's like they they they're able to do both of those things, you know. Right. They, yeah, sure. they, mm -hmm. they so they have they have the wheel, you know, they have hammers, they have clothing, they have technology. Yeah, they've 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 they've, they've somehow managed to. They keep they keep it all under the thumb of their spiritual life, because they can they can deal with that. You know, like at some point in like the you know eighteenth nineteenth century, you know, we were at a point where we we generated a certain amount of technological uh, toolkit, but it was still under the thumb of a religious orientation. Now we that toolkit has expanded so rapidly and so insanely over the last hundred years that it's 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 stomped out our religious life okay well mm -hmm. certainly it's, it's just a matter of well we got to get all these tools back under our thumb the way that the amish have with hammers and wheels you know but it doesn't seem to be impossible it's just the same it's the same problem just scaled up to a to a kind of staggering degree um but you know i, I don't think there's anything fundamentally different about hammers and lunar modules it's just it's the same problem it's the same question of reconciling all this back into a spiritually focused religious worldview right um i wish i could see i wish i could see some way to move towards that it does not <clears throat> seem easy yeah i don't i don't necessarily see the way i just kind of have a vague intuition that it it's possible somehow i don't know I just have a, I don't know. I just have a feeling about it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, okay. Um, all right. He's, he's going after mathematics in one of these parts and which makes me, which, which gets my hackles up. So, but we don't have to get into that. Um, I'm trying to see like, what are, what are like big ideas in here? Okay. Here's one. Um, so this is in the last chapter. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, this is when he's really coming down hard. You know, his, his rhetoric is getting really kind of like, <clears throat> you know, nasty towards science. Uh, and he says, this is why the application of science, which is not really the application of science at all, but the application of an unbelievable ignorance has produced such disequilibrium, ugliness, and even destruction, not only in the natural world, but in human life as well. And my question is, didn't the fall do that? I mean, is it really, is it science's fault, you know, that we have disequilibrium and ugliness and destruction in the world? Like, isn't this the, isn't this built into the fabric of things, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I just, um, I, I think there can be a danger in this kind of thinking to be like, oh, well, if we could only just turn back the clock, to the 12th century, there wouldn't be all this disequilibrium and ugliness in the world. Where I imagine if you actually found yourself back in 12th century, you know, Sweden, you'd you'd be like, oh no, there's 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 massive amounts of disequilibrium and ugliness that I wasn't even thinking about because I was because in the 21st century, I'm only focused on the ugliness of the technological world. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Um So it's just another question no, of like I don't I don't think we really disagree with what you're saying there. Yeah. Yeah. 
like is it is it technology that's the problem or is it like we're the problem you know we have to you know it's 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 human agency that is at fault here you know we're not using this stuff correctly we've we've messed the situation up but there's nothing inherently uh dysfunctional about having a toolkit you know right well it's, it's the, the i mean it's the technology amplifies amplifies you could say you could well i don't even know if i'd say agency it, it amplifies human power yeah uh, the yeah. reason i wouldn't say I, the reason i wouldn't say agency is because i think oftentimes that power ends up enslaving us and actually limiting our agency yeah. um it, I, like a power is weird that way where having more of it doesn't necessarily make you more free um Um. Yeah. No. I. I yes. It, I mean, it seems like it. It, it is. It, these are just. These are. You know, technology is just a. You know, it's a. It's a. I'm saying this over and over again, but it's something that just increases the power of of fallen humans. Yeah. So. So yes, to, to the extent that we live into our fallenness and we have more and more powerful like ways of living out that fallenness, then the more impact that fallenness will have on us and everything else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah. So fighting our fallenness is the thing we have to do. Yes, that exactly right. Yeah. And that's why I in, in all of these conversations, you know, this is why I keep advocating for like, you know. The, the, the central piece of all this is the spiritual struggle. And, and, and there's only so much mileage we're going to get out of, you know, all of this critique, you know, critiquing political systems, critiquing technology, critiquing this, critiquing that, critique, 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 and ignoring the like spiritual struggle at the core of it, you know, because that's, that's really the only game in town. That's the only thing that's going to have any impact on all these other <clears throat> structures because the, the politics and the, the, the technology, all this stuff, these are all outgrowths of a, of like what's going on within people. Right. Although I think for a lot of people and for a lot of communities, limiting the technology that they use in ways that they're not currently will mm -hmm. help them with the spiritual struggle. That is, that is yeah. my guess. Well, that is, that is true. I mean, that is like, you know, a practical day to day question of like, what, what, what should your technology use actually look like in order to like maybe mitigate some of the negative uh, impacts of living in the technological world? Right. And, and I don't know, like, if there's... Are, are the... oh, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, I was just going to say, I don't know if, you know, nobody has a good answer to that, you know, cause we're so swamped with it all the time. And certainly you got to get, get away from it sometimes. Um, so it's like, that kind might of be... like oh go ahead no 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 go, go ahead go ahead yeah i was just you know it's like none of us are going to uh you know right now none of us are, are in a position where we're going to say oh uh you know we should shut down these uh you know these programs to go to other planets or right. or whatever like you know that that isn't where you know you know no one no one who would want to do that has the influence to do it currently so right. that's you're, you're right. It's, it's the it's it's the it's at the communal level and at the individual level that we have to figure out the spiritual struggle right now, and we have to answer practical questions about what we're going to do with technology. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I don't really have any other notes. Um, is there anything else you want to point out or or bring up? Yeah, well, maybe I could just like talk a little bit about. This. I mean, specifically the, the the moon question was interesting to me. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so here's here. I mean, here's the thing that I'd say, and I and I, I I really like to tie this to you know the, the same kind of idea of you know in in the Renaissance. You might have heard me say this already, but in, in you know in the Renaissance we had this we had gotten to the point where we were willing to treat human bodies very, very differently. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like then, 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 uh, then, you know, so the, the Orthodox would, would 
would suggest. We'd say that right. you know, the, the, the body is a sacred thing and it ought to be treated in a particular way. And I, I do think that there's this, this overly mechanistic way of looking at the whole world, of looking at the whole cosmos. Yeah. That <clears throat> when you look through that lens, it affects what. So I think that, you know, we end up with a very, you know, a very utilitarian way of seeing anatomy when you start treating human bodies like they're dead meat machines. Sure. Um, but you also, you now we view human bodies as dead meat machines, like the, their ability sure. to be iconographic, their ability to act as an icon when they're a meat machine is, is, is severely limited. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's the same pattern. I think that, that we participated in with the way that we handled the moon I think the moon is 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 like his like in in church history that there's a very very rich way that we saw the moon. You know the um, the moon is is associated with the night, with the implicit, with the cyclical, you know, with the right. feminine, with the left hand right. of Christ in iconography. It's mm -hmm. the luminary that rules the night. It's a lot of things um, in the Christian like you could say mythopoetic world that we've used to help understand who and like what we are and what our place is in the cosmos. The moon was never a dusty rock. And, yeah. <clears throat> and the, the thing is, I don't actually think that there's anything wrong with going to the moon necessarily. Again, it's as long as you don't aid desacralization in the process. And mm. so if we're already to the point where we've, desacralize the moon and that's the direction that we're already moving in it's hard for me to see how you know like at least if you're trying if, if your goal is to slow down that process and try to try to and try to fight some of that process and try to bring some of that 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 sacred mythopoetic i don't know like cosmological order back into the way that you're you're processing you know your life and everything around you and your place in this you know this beautiful created order I don't see how, you know, taking a bunch of pictures of the moon as this rock and as, you know, as this thing that, you know, human beings can just traipse all over and stick a flag on is, is helpful. Well, I, I guess the way I think of it is like, <clears throat> okay, well, let's, let's think about medicine. Um, so like, yeah, in the Renaissance, you know, people would like dig up corpses and dissect them in ways that were, you know, previously considered intolerable and yeah we treated and, and from the orthodox perspective kind of still still kind of is seen as sure sure you know? yeah sure for, sure for, for our like, audience it, that doesn't know you know we don't even like cremate our dead yeah and it is yeah. it is it is true that that desacralized the body and it turned the body into a meat machine now this goes back to this question of having both like can we like because we did that we've we've significantly increased our ability to deal with uh medical problems so like because we've because we did that we went through this period of desacralizing the body and viewing it as a meat machine we're able to like <clears throat> i don't know like keep children alive who might not have been able to live given some given xyz medical condition or whatever like we've we've gained all this medical ability by viewing the body as a meat machine. Now the question is like, can we become religiously, spiritually focused people again and also keep children alive who would have died had we not gone through this period of viewing the body as a meat machine? Because there are two things at play. Right. The, the body is a sacred vessel made in the image of God. Okay. And it is and it is full of all this symbolic import and, and, and cosmological significance and spiritual significance. It is also literally a meat machine that has problems that develop, that has mechanical problems that develop as being a meat machine. So I would say it's something like, you know, think about the moon in the same way. Like, okay, the moon is this symbolic object that is rich with significance it is all these things it is also literally a big rock in the sky you know so like can you somehow 
it's the same question. Like, can we have, yeah, we went through this period of desacralization in order to gain yeah. these medical tools. Okay, we also went through this period of desacralization with the moon where we treated it like a big dead rock in order to gain the ability to like, you know, <clears throat> touch it and fly around it or whatever. Is there some future where we can have a sacred idea of the body, but still have modern medical tools and have, you know, a sacred understanding of the moon, but also have, you know, lunar rovers and have people like, you know, going there and stuff. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. No, it tru truly is the question. I, yeah. I mean, I guess it would be wonderful if the answer was yes. <laughs> well, I, I think it's like, Either the answer is yes, or like, or like the game is over. Like the answer is either yes, or like we're just waiting around for, you know, some kind of horrific end to humanity in the very near future. Which maybe that's the case, you know. So that's what Melville thought, or would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I guess my, my preference is to try for optimism you know so i would like sure. to think that there's some kind of really cool future where it's like you know <clears throat> star trek but people are religious you know it's like we can we don't like that there's no such thing as the common cold anymore you know and and no, and no like children don't like die you know in infancy anymore but you know people are spiritually oriented and religious where 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 you can like take a trip to the to mars but people are religiously oriented and spiritual i i, I don't know something like that mm. it's like a set some kind of like sci-fi dream you know but i i, I don't know yeah, yeah. well it's weird it's weird how sci-fi dreams seem to be an important part of talking about the current moment yeah like yeah, I don't. It, it doesn't seem to be any way around it because if we're trying to posit a future, all of the futures that we can imagine right now are very strange and alien. <laughs> well, that's you know, and that's one thing I say to people is like, we are now an interplanetary species. Like whether you like it or not, or whether it's good or bad, or whether like this is a new condition that we have to somehow understand. We have to reconcile all of our systems of thought around this new fact. You know, and it's very, it's dizzying and it's very difficult. And I don't think we've done, I think, I think we're just at a point now where like the technology has like way outstripped us and we're trying to catch up to it, but, but hopefully we will catch up and we'll kind of put it back all under the thumb of humanity and, you know, have some kind of actual future. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, that's been that's been a it's been a very interesting conversation. Yes, I'm, I'm glad I took the time to do it. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on, and I appreciate you sending me that book. Um, so, what's uh, yeah. what's what's next for you in 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 your work down there or over there? Man, really, really just tackling the language. I have to learn Creole, which is kind of the the language that everyone speaks here. And from there, if I get you know, if I become proficient enough at that, then I'll move on to learning some of the, the tribal languages. That makes a much bigger deal to the people here if you can speak their tribal language. Oh, you know, yeah, I'm sure. You can, you can communicate with them in Creole, but once you know, you know, Mende or, or, or Kisi or whatever, then they're like, oh, wow, like no one, no one takes the time to figure out how to do that. So that, that yeah. would be kind of the goal. Um, so did you, like, did you start that process before you left? Like, have you been learning the language or are you just like going full immersion? No, well, oh, I full full immersion. That's just how first things does it. In fact, yeah. sometimes they won't send people places because they already know the appropriate language. I don't. I don't exactly know how they developed that approach, but that's what they do. Yeah. Oh, oh, let me give you like let me give you a weird pitch to your audience. Okay. You know, cool. If you're, yeah, part yeah. Of, if you're if you're if you're part of you know the 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 dissident right or the you know the the reasonable center, wherever whatever this ecology <laughs> is getting called now. Here, here's my weird pitch. You want to learn about how culture is communicable and how it isn't. Mm. That this, is, this will tell you a lot about that. Because First Things okay. understands that there are ways that I should not and cannot become Sierra Leonean. Right. 
But there are, are also extremely deep ways that I can embed myself into that. And I, I tell you, even just mm. from having been here a month, doing that on the ground is really different from like sitting around on the internet thinking about how culture works in your head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. That 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 is actually fascinating. And it would be great to have you back on in like six months and talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah. to do that. Yeah. yeah. All yeah, right. you should talk to John too. His podcast. I'm sure he would love to have you as a guest on his podcaster. If you wanted to have him on your channel, you should. should oh think yeah, about it. and let me let me just reiterate that for the audience. Check out John Hears podcast. Um, why are we talking about rabbits? Um, which is on YouTube and it's on. Um, I think it's like everywhere. Um, yeah, probably. So. Yeah, check that out. Check out First Things Foundations, which is probably just firstthingsfoundations.com, right? I imagine maybe dot org. I don't know. Yeah, something but like you, that. If you Google First Things Foundation, you'll find it. Yeah. <clears throat> cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. All right. All right. Have a good one. Right. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye.